And this seminar is the same place where you can, by the way, ask questions live of Mazier, Mazier during the talk in the question comment chat box. So I think with that, let's just get to it. And I am thrilled to roll out the latest episode of the IBM Kiss Kid Live Quantum Seminar Series dedicated to you, the research and academic communities. I'm your host, Slav Kuminov. And today, it's my real pleasure to invite here uh, Mazir Mirahimi from Quantic Inria on repetition cat codes. Hello, Mazir. How are you today? Hi, Hi Zalatil. How are you? Thanks for the invitation. Uh, I think the pleasure will be ours. Uh, where are you tuning in from today, Mazir? Uh, from my home, uh, outside, just outside Paris. Oh, lovely. Um, well, I think, Mazir, before we pull up your slides, uh, let me just give a little bit of background to folks. So Mazir Mirahimi graduated from Ecole Polytechnique and did his PhD with Pierre Rochon at Ecole des Mines uh, and finished in 2005, working on the control and estimation of Schrodinger type equations You know, very early on. He was then almost immediately hired as a scientist at INRIA Paris uh, in 2006, and since then, he's worked with um, many uh, great physicists, including Sir Hiroshi and, and Michel Devoray and Rob Shokoff and so forth at various places. He's currently the director of research at Enria, he's a professor at Ecole Polytechnique, leader of the Quantic team, and you know, recipient of many awards and uh, master of CAT codes. Uh, so I think without further ado, I'm going to uh, turn it over to Mazir, and folks, feel free to ask questions uh, during the talk and I'll try to get those up to Mazier. So Mazier, the stage is yours. Uh, thanks, Zlatko, for the, for the kind presentation and and, uh, and also for the invitation. So I'm, I'll be talking about a topic which has been interest, uh, uh, which in which I've been interested for, for, for a while now, for about uh, uh, seven, eight years. So the cat qubit. Uh, and it's basically I'm going to present one of the or latest works uh, so together with my previous PhD student uh, Jeremy Guyot, uh, who is now uh, at uh, working at this new startup Alice and Bob. Um, and so uh, the topic is repetition cat qubits, as you see. So <laughs> first. Uh, why don't we have today a quantum computer which is capable of uh, doing uh, a revolution, basically solving uh, Schwarz factorization algorithm, uh, implementing Schwarz factorization algorithm, or any other nice algorithm that we would like it to uh, implement? Uh, well, basically, it's, the problem is noise, as you might know. Uh, we know that, uh, well, a classical computer is a, quite a reliable object basically uh, we can for example when consider a classical ram uh, of, a, of a classical computer uh, we have uh, and we do operations on these qubits on these bits uh, then it's these operations can we can be uh, uh, really rely on them because basically we have uh, the probability of having an error on one of these bits uh, operation is something about 10 to the power minus 25. So basically for most uh, useful algorithms that you might want to implement, uh, you don't need to worry much about these nodes. Whereas in the quantum case, it's uh, even though we have had, uh, we've gone a long way, uh, we are still quite far from what we want to reach. But basically uh, today we get the best uh, processes that we have have error rates of about 10 minus 3 or 10 minus 4 per bit per operation. Uh, and we would like to reach something of, uh, between 10 minus 10 and 10 minus 15 to start to see some algorithms uh, where we have some provable, uh, basically, acceleration uh, and provable useful acceleration with respect to a uh, classical computer. So, for example, typically the Schroes uh, factorization algorithm. Uh, and so, how can we do that? And so, that's the topic which is uh, which in which we are interested in, in our team, in Quantic team. Uh, so, well, we know that uh, for a while people have, uh, of course, uh, since basically the 1990s, uh, uh, and from the initial the famous work by Peter Shaw, we know that uh, there might be a path forward in this direction, which is through error correction. 
the main idea here is that uh, well you need uh, we have some high errors uh, error rates noise processes uh, but they might be uh, they might have a nice property which is basically but in some sense they they are local physical processes they are induced by some physical local physical processes and in that case basically the idea of uh, protection through error correction is that we're gonna in, encode information in a non-local manner basically in a non-local degrees of freedom of a, of a system typically the example that everybody uh, talks about and which is basically uh, a lot of groups are trying to develop is the surface code so um, I know that you guys at IBM for example are uh, quite interested in that so the surface code, uh, as you might know, we use basically a, a patch, a surface uh, of uh, many qubits here. Uh, so I'm using these uh, figures from uh, the paper by Astin Fowler and co from 2012, where you see uh, these uh, basically black dots representing data qubits. And then, uh, uh, I'm sorry, uh, the white dots, which are these data qubits, and then the black dots, which are, oops, sorry, uh, which are somehow uh, some ancillary qubits used to perform the measurement of some uh, observables, some parity type uh, observables, and which basically can reveal whether some local error has occurred uh, on these uh, uh, on these data qubits, on these white qubits. So this total patch, this, uh, this basically square of many many qubits, encodes a single logical qubit. Uh, whose basically logical x and z operators are provided by the product by the multiplication of the x operators of the x, of the uh, of the these white qubits on a line uh, joining the two edges of the surface or uh, for the same for the z on the other direction. So we need to see that if we want to induce basically a logical x error, then we need for uh, all these qubits to undergo an x error. Uh, which is perhaps a very, uh, the probability of such a process might be very small and therefore we might uh, hope that such, such a system represents actually a very good logical qubit. And there is something uh, other than this, which is that we can perform also operations, uh, very precise operations, logical operations on this, uh, on this uh, logical qubit here. Uh, through some uh, techniques that have been, for example, uh, presented in this paper, uh, overviewed in this paper, uh, so which are quite nice. Uh, so this is all nice, and of course, uh, we really hope that this uh, is going to give actually the logical qubits that we would like to have to be able to perform all these algorithms. There is somehow where uh, still uh, a lot of um, obstacles to overcome uh, basically the uh, the idea is that uh, so again we uh, use this other figure from the same paper uh, if you look at this uh, the probability of logical errors for this surface code that we saw in the previous slide and then we uh, on the on the x axis we have the uh, probability of physical error, so basically the probability of having an error on each of these data or ancillary qubits, which is given by uh, uh, some value between which you see on the x-axis. And then we ask, where can we go on the logical level? What kind of probability can we get on the logical level? And we try, we try to trace this probability of logical, logical error probability as a function of physical per step uh, physical error probability. So we can ask, what is this error probability? Or probability, for example, it could be the C naught operations that you are that are used in the in the measurement process uh, for uh, doing error correction. And so, uh, then if you look at these curves and these uh, different colors represent different uh, sizes of this surface. Basically, D equals to three corresponds to a three by three. Uh, uh, surface code, so meaning that you have three data nine data qubits basically and five uh, d equals to five is five by five and etc and so it's basically you have nine basically times two uh, qubits because you have the same amount of qubits to measure the error center 
And then uh, if you look at these uh, probabilities, you, what you see is that basically uh, when you increase the number of qubits, uh, you might be able to win indeed as in the logical error probability, but only if your physical error probability is below some threshold value. Um, basically for the case of the uh, surface code, if you consider some secret, what we, what, what we call surface, secret based error model, uh, which is the error model, which is the closest basically to the experiment, uh, to the experiments, then this uh, threshold lies somewhere between uh, some uh, around half a percent. So basically you need to do all your operations at a half a percent level so that you can be sure that by increasing the size of the logical, uh, by the size of the surface code, you can win in the logical error probability. Uh, so that's maybe uh, not bad because basically uh, today's experiments are at this level. We can perform now operations uh, at 99.5% uh, fidelity, so which is the value of uh, this threshold. We can hope that in within a few years we can reliably do them maybe even at lower values of uh, prob uh, 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 probability, basically a factor of 10 may be better. But then the question is that, then how many qubits do we need to get to some particular level of logical error? And then the second figure shows this with this value. So basically, for example, if you're trying to get to a value of about 10 minus five, and you have a, a physic per, uh, per step physical error rate of about a factor of 10 better than threshold, so which means that basically fidelity is above 99.95%. But then you still need about 100 qubits in your surface to, to reach this uh, logical error probability of 10 minus 5, or something about 1,000 to get to 10 minus 10. And, uh, and, and so this is, uh, of course, uh, so we see that there is a path forward, but of course there is a large overhead in the number of qubits that are required to be used to get to these uh, small probabilities. So just remind, remember that, for example, for the Shor's algorithm, uh, to get to be able to solve basically um, the first uh, uh, factorization that might be uh, not accessible to a classical computer, uh, you might need something about 10,000 qubit logical qubits. And then on top of that, uh, you'll need to, to add maybe a thousand or more uh, physical qubits, uh, which are all at this level. So it's about 10 million uh, physical qubits at this level of uh, performance to be able to do to perform the shorts factorization. So it's, it seems like a very large overhead and hard to achieve, at least in a very short in a short period of time. So that's. Uh, what, what we are interested in doing in our team is basically trying to somehow reduce this overhead requirement for this error correction. Uh, so one approach that people follow in this uh, regard is uh, what we call the hard, some hardware efficiently localization of information, which is through bosonic codes. Through, so the idea is that we, instead of encoding information in uh, a many body state of many qubits, we try to in, rather encode information uh, in, in the infinite dimensional Hilbert space of a harmonic oscillator that you see over here. So, uh, and try to somehow use uh, the fact that we have these infinite dimensions to perform some first levels of error correction to somehow protect uh, or information against some types of error at least, errors at least. And maybe then later we can concatenate these bosonic codes with uh, more uh, elaborated many qubit codes. So, uh, by the way, I want to advertise this uh, quite nice uh, review uh, paper that appeared earlier this year uh, with some colleagues, so, uh, which basically goes over many of these bosonic codes that are uh, that people are studying. Um, so, here in this slide, I, I'm just going to show two of these bosonic codes in which uh, which we consider which, uh, which we are interested in our team. So the first type is uh, these GKP codes, uh, so uh, the grid states of light, where basically the zeros and ones are these uh, frequency cones. Uh, somehow this, uh, this uh, well, it's not a frequency here, it's a position cones, basically. Uh, so you have basically two K functions, the blue and the orange, which represent the zero and one. 
which are where we see that they are uh, well separated in the Q quadrature, but also somehow in the P quadrature, if you consider them in the dual basis. And then basically this this makes sure that any um, any perturbation or any noise which can be seen as a small as a local diffusion in the phase space, so small displacements in Q or small displacements in P, will not affect uh, or the the logical information which is encoded there. So basically, we can retrieve this information later. And uh, the kind of uh, encoding that we I'm going to talk about today is more about using these cat states, which is somehow less uh, subtle uh, uh, encoding of information than these GKP uh, codes. Basically, the encoding is that the zero and one states can be seen as two coherent states. So we prefer actually to rather see uh, things uh, with the plus and minus states of these uh, around the x-axis of this uh, plus and minus states around the x-axis of this uh, uh, qubit, which are represented by these two cat states, or negative cat states, which are uh, the even and odd superpositions of two coherent states, alpha and minus alpha. So it's basically a harmonic oscillator with a, with a zero phase, which is oscillating at zero phase or at pi phase, or uh, uh, basically it is oscillating at the two, both phases at the same time. So we have this superposition state, which is used as the plus state of a curving cat state, and the minus state is going to be the same with the minus sign between alpha and minus alpha. And these two states are actually exactly orthogonal to each other, uh, the plus and minus states, uh, cat plus, what we call cat plus and cat minus, they are exactly orthogonal to each other because if you write them in the Fox state basis, Fox state basis, basically you see even even photon number states or odd photon number states for plus and minus. So basically they have disjoint uh, uh, support in the Fox basis. So they are orthogonal to each other. And so your zero and one are actually the even, uh, are the even and odd superpositions of these two cat states which is approximately given by the two coherent states because you know that very well that the two coherent states alpha and minus alpha are not exactly equivalent, but these two positions are. Okay, so this is our qubit. And so why is this qubit interesting? You'll see later on. Uh, basically, uh, very similarly to the GKB code, uh, when you try, when you assume that your noises are local in the phase space, uh, is, have a local impact on the phase space of your harmonic oscillator, Basically, you can see that the, there is a very small probability that you join, uh, ju you jump from this zero state to the uh, one state. Basically, so we suppress one type of error, which is basically the bit flips here. So uh, we will uh, we'll see that uh, uh, this is what we call a biased noise qubit. Basically, okay. So um, let me just maybe uh, mention that well. Uh, we know very well that a coherent state is quite easy to stabilize in a, uh, in, a, in, a, uh, in a harmonic oscillator, in a cavity, in a superconducting cavity typically. You basically only need to uh, consider a, a driven damped harmonic oscillator, a driven damped cavity, for example. Uh, so with a damping rate of kappa 1, so which we can model for the, with a Lindblad equation, for example, with a Lindblad operator, which is given by uh, the annihilation operator times some rate, which is here given by square root of kappa one, and then uh, some. If you assume that you have some resonant drive with this harmonic uh, for, for this harmonic oscillator, basically you're driving it as resonance for this frequency, with this resonance frequency, uh, which can be modeled in the rotating frame of the harmonic oscillator in this manner. Then, basically, uh, the this driven damp harmonic oscillator is, uh, uh, has a steady state which is given by a coherent state which is given by the uh, by alpha being the ratio between epsilon 1 so which is the amplitude of the drive divided by kappa 1 being the uh, strength of damping so it's uh, interesting because we have an open quantum system here it's a dissipative system However, the steady state of this uh, driven damped harmonic, uh, uh, driven damped system is a pure state, it's a coherent state. So this is, of course, uh, trivial, everybody knows this, but no, we can do something maybe more interesting, is that, no, assume that we can engineer a particular harmonic oscillator which exchanges photons in pairs with its environment. So, okay, so first maybe, uh, I'm sorry, let me 
So maybe some way of seeing why alpha is a is a is a steady state of this system is that this uh, Hamiltonian plus this Limbladian can be seen as effectively as an as a Limbladian, Limblad with a Limblad operator, which is given by by a minus alpha, and we see that this coherent state alpha is in the kernel of this Limbladian in the, this Limblad operator. So now, what happens if we uh, we have a harmonic oscillator? which exchanges photons in pairs with this environment. Basically, each time it loses photons, it, pair, uh, it loses them in pairs. And each time it gains photons through a drive, it gains them in pairs as well. So uh, basically, this can be modeled by uh, this type of squeezing type Hamiltonian and the Lindblad operator, which is given by A squared. And then uh, what's nice is that we, this total system can be also seen as a, effectively with a Lindblad operator, which is given by a squared minus alpha squared. And now if you look at the kernel of this operator, you see that you have two states, two possible states in this kernel. And basically two coherent states, alpha and minus alpha, are both in the kernel of this operator. And so what it says is that if you do, if you use such a system, the steady state can be anywhere in the span of these two states. So basically, we can converge towards uh, any superposition or mixture of these states. Basically. And this alpha here is now given by the square root of the ratio between the drive strength of epsilon 2 and, and kappa 2 being the two photon damping um, strength. So that's uh, how basically we define our qubit. We assume that we can, uh, assuming that we can engineer a particular uh, driven damped harmonic oscillator which exchanges photons in pairs, uh, we can define a qubit as a steady state, which is now given by these two coherent states alpha minus alpha. And this is what we call the cat qubit. Okay, so this is nice, but how can we, how can one engineer such a system? How can one engineer a, two, uh, a cavity? Uh, which exchange photons in pairs with this environment. So basically the idea is that we're going to use uh, an ancillary system uh, which mediates this interaction between or cavity or harmonic oscillator of interest and uh, the path, the cold path. Uh, so we have this blue in blue here, we're going to have the cat mode, basically the memory mode that we uh, want to use to put our formation. Uh, in black, you have your bath, and in in red here, you have the, uh, the intermediary uh, mode, which allows you to basically engineer this two photon interaction. And so the idea is that this uh, this uh, inter uh, intermediary mode is going to be a nonlinear mode, and then uh, using some Josephson junction or a circuit based on Josephson junctions. Uh, and then using some three wave or four wave mixing properties of this uh, nonlinear device and some pumping mechanism, basically applying some drive at uh, some particular uh, frequency, which is given by twice the frequency of the, uh, the, the mode of interest and the, this basically buffer mode, T, uh, we can engineer a part, uh, this type of interaction, effectively engineer this type of interaction where two photons of the mode A are exchanged with a single photon of the mode D. And then this mode D sees a cold bath, which is basically uh, each time uh, two photons of this uh, mode A are basically transformed to a single photon of uh, this mode D. It is then damped through its damping, uh, through its coupling through the bath. And then Effectively, you can see this as a two-photon damping of the A mode. And now, if you add in top of this Hamil effective Hamiltonian another Hamiltonian, which is a the drive on this on this D mode, the resonant drive on this D mode, then these single photons uh, of this drive can, through the same process, get uh, transferred to two photons of the of the mode A, basically. So somehow this this would engineer for you this effective two mode driving Hamiltonian and this would engineer the two mode uh, the effective two photon dissipation that we're looking for. And so how can we now what is this uh, basically uh, intermediary mode? How can we engineer it? So the in the latest uh, versions of so this this basically this idea has been experimented uh, has been you know, tried in few experiments uh, so far. So the initial experiment was done in Michel Devore's group at Yale in 2015. 
And then uh, through some generations of this experiment, uh, this has been improved. Uh, the quality of this uh, basically two photon uh, driving, uh, two photon pumping mechanism has been improved. And in the latest version, which has appeared in this paper uh, by our team, by the team of Sekilektas, uh, TNS, at, uh, and, uh, which is part of the quantum team, uh, we use basically a different system uh, than the pre two previous uh, experiments. Which is use uh, which is this basically uh, parametric mix mixing device to perform this uh, two photon mixture. So maybe uh, I'm seeing that I'm going pretty slowly. So I had a slide on the function of this uh, device, which is which we call the ATS for asymmetrically threaded screen. I might jump this uh, slide. Uh, so you just know that there is a way to engineer uh, a pre-wave mixing. Uh, a, a clean three-wave mixing process, which basically at the end gives you this two-photon exchange Hamiltonian uh, that we were wishing to achieve. Okay. And uh, when you say clean um, in the experiments, uh, how, how close to that have we seen? Um, so yes, that's a very good question. So the, uh, the idea is that um, basically the value of this two-photon strength, so it was maybe this uh, two-photon exchange strength, is what we want to increase as much as we can. Uh, this value is basically proportional to the drive strength here, uh, to the to the strength of the pump in purple that you had here. And uh, of what happens is that usually we see that uh, this uh, this value somehow gets limited by some. Uh, to, I mean, you, you cannot push it as hard as you want because at some point you see that uh, uh, some uh, new processes start to happen that basically limit the value of this uh, two photon coupling strength. And in the earlier experiments, unfortunately, where uh, this value never got higher than some spurious uh, interaction, uh, uh, some, some spurious coupling terms that already existed. And so basically, some kind of cross care, for example. Hamiltonian between the A and D mode. Here, uh, in this new uh, design, basically, uh, Zaki and Raphael and uh, the workers, they were able to basically re re remove uh, this kind of Crosscur Hamilton, uh, Hamiltonians, which were limiting the performance of this device, but keeping only this uh, useful interaction. Hamilton. That's why, what I, why I call it clean, somehow. You don't have the spurious parts of the Hamilton. And, and that's to not just first order, but also like second order and... Okay, so no, this is uh, up to first order. Of course, you will have some second order uh, terms coming. Uh, you, you'll you have some effectively some uh, second order cross curve terms have, uh, occurring here. But I uh, hope, uh, uh, fortunately, what happens is that as far as these cross curve terms are smaller than the two effective two photon dissipation rate, you're fine. Basically, you can uh, still keep uh, the uh, you you can show some bit flips of exponential bit flip separation as I'm going to show later. So basically, you just it's kind of a threshold value. You need to to make this G two photon to be large enough with respect to everything else, and then you'll be fine. So that's uh, mm -hmm. great. Even though Thank there you. is some mm -hmm. spurious terms, it's not going to bother us. Okay. So now once we have that's one of one to get so once we have such a device that uh, such a two photon driven dissipative mechanism basically we can say that we have a qubit which has a which has it biased nodes in the sense that uh, by increasing the amplitude of the cat basically increasing alpha squared uh, which is quite easily done in our experiment basically it's uh, the value of this alpha as i mentioned earlier here is given by the ratio between the two photon drive, epsilon two, and kappa two, which in this picture is somehow the value between epsilon d and g two. So basically, by increasing this epsilon d, we can increase uh, the size of the cat. So it's in a, it's a quite simple knob that we have in the experiment to increase the size of the cat, size of the cat. And this uh, with this symbol increase of the uh, of the size of the cat, in principle. We should be able to separate the zero and one uh, states of a um, logical qubit for in the phase space, so that if we assume that all the error processes are local, local diffusions in the phase space, with the dissipative mechanism, 
which stabilizes these two states, we can basically get rid of all those uh, mechanisms. And so we have basically we can suppress the probability of jumping from zero to one and all vice versa. Mm. Maybe one quick question, Mazir. Um, yes. um, this maybe a little more on the details part. Um, you have this question here is so the control happens through this sort of fast flux line, if I understand correctly. And um, what about the noise on that? Uh, is that local in some sense or is that, uh, you know, uh, how much do we have to worry about that noise? Yes, that's uh, correct. So you might have some uh, noise, uh, additional noise in this phi sigma you mentioned, I'm mentioning. Uh, as far as it is basically off resonant with respect to the uh, to the modes that you have here. So basically it doesn't turn on some new processes uh, that you might worry about. You should, you're fine, right? I mean, th this is maybe you might have some noise in this epsilon zero value. That noise is only some noise in the G2 photon value. It's not a big deal. But if you have some other noises which occur, which uh, occur there and which, which basically turn on some maybe uh, other coupling, like A4 B dagger term, something like that, something uh, uh, which which was not there, then we have to take it into account. Uh, again, I believe if those uh, spurious Hamiltonians, which come because of that noise, are small with respect to uh, lead to basically local diffusions in the phase space with respect to the effective kappa two photon, which is the largest interaction term, uh, uh, la largest basically uh, term in your system, uh, frequency largest rate in your system, you should be fine again. With respect to phase uh, to bit flips, you're gonna have maybe some spurious bit flips, uh, phase flips that are gonna appear, but that's uh, again uh, we should be we're gonna take care of that in a different manner. Is that uh, does that answer to your question? Yes, yes. Thank you, thank you. Okay, so okay, so just maybe this slide. Uh, let me just wrap up this slide, which says that well you can see quite easily why we have some suppression of bit flips, uh, which appears, appears to be exponential. But you might also some have linear increase in the phase flips, which is big just because the fact because of the fact that when you increase the size of the cat, uh, basically these fringes of the cat get closer to each other, but they close get closer only linearly and in n bar. So it's one over n bar. So, which means that no, of, of course, the local diffusions in this phase space might lead to phase phase flips because basically the plus state is the state with a fringe with a positive fringe in the middle, and the minus state is a state with a negative fringe in the middle. So we see that of course it's easier now to get from the positive to the negative by just a small diffusion in, in the p direction, in the imaginary direction. But uh, this, if, as far as this is only linear and we have exponential gain here, we should be good. So that's basically what these numerical simulations show this idea. Basically, if you simulate uh, these two photon driven damped process and together with a single photon, uh, undesired single photon process, which is there because your cavity, you cannot make it uh, as high Q as you want. It's going to have some loss, some uh, intrinsic loss. Uh, then you'll see what you see is that when we increase the size of the cat, we still have this effective bit flip rate of a cat, which is going to get which is going to decrease in a uh, exponential manner. We have a logarithmic scale scaling in the y axis, whereas the uh, the phase flip rate is going to increase only linearly uh, with the with the size of the cat. Uh, in some way, this is very similar to a repetition curve. Basically. So basically, when you have a, you know that but let's assume that you have a qubit with some bit flip probability and some phase flip probability. Let's assume for now that they are at the same level. So we have the same amount of phase flip uh, and bit flip error probabilities. And we try to just correct for bit flips. So in order to do that, so with a repetition code, basically we encode zero with D zeros and one with D ones. And so uh, now the plus and minus logical states are gonna be the superposition of, uh, gonna be these kind of GHC states, which are gonna be the uh, the superposition of all zeros and also all ones with plus and minus sign. Now, uh, what is the probability uh, of, uh, and let's assume that we perform some parity measurements, two by two parity measurements and correct errors. What is the probability of having uh, an X error? If your measurements are perfect, everything is 
perfect, then the probability of having a measure, uh, an X error, a bit flip error in the logical level is that uh, is given by the probability that most of these qubits, uh, more than half of these qubits, have jumped, have bit flipped. And this probability basically goes to zero with uh, exponentially in the size D of the curve. Whereas, uh, oops. Whereas if you look at the phase flip error probability, basically this phase flip error probability is just given by, at first order, is given by the probability of each qubit jumping. So basically if each of these qubits uh, uh, undergoes a phase flip, the total system has undergone a phase, uh, phase flip. So basically the probability of phase flip is increasing linearly. In, in some sense, this uh, cat code is the same thing. It's basically the n bar is replacing t of the repetition. Um, so just maybe uh, this slide to compare to finish this comparison here. Uh, it's uh, by uh, so we had this uh, experiment in the group uh, so by Zaki and Rafael and um, so I guess we had Zaki actually last week by talking about a different uh, topic. Uh, but uh, so in a recent experiment they were showing they were able to show this actual exponential suppression by a factor of three hundred. So when we increase the photon number from one to something about four. Um, so this got saturated to something about a millisecond. And this, uh, we basically understand quite well why this happens here and this, uh, why this saturation happens. So there is, there is no, some no local process, which is there because of some, uh, so basically it's because of the system that is there to do the tomography that was overcoupled. And so we should be able to get rid of that limitation in the next generation. So we should be able to go further in this uh, bit flip suppression. And uh, very recently, you, there was this paper by Google Group uh, where we, they were able to use their Sycamore chip uh, and perform some uh, uh, error correction with the, uh, with the, as a repetition code. Uh, and so basically remove either phase flips or bit flips, but not both of them together, to the same level of 300, basically. So basically, we can say that there is a version of this repetition code that we have. With the same performance. Mm. So, yes. Oh, good. Um, and maybe you're getting into this. There was a question from the audience, so maybe on on understanding the core cat qubit versus the two photon process. But we can get to that. Uh, no, I'm not going to get much to that actually. So there is a so there is a there are some differences. Yes, that's true. Uh, so the big uh, difference I would say is that um, in the in the dissipative cat uh, mechanic, uh, cats. Uh, so I actually I don't have any uh, any slide on that. So I need to, to talk about it just uh, here. So um, in the dissipative mechanism, basically we have a uh, process which uh, evacuates the entropy of the system. Basically, we can avoid any kind of leakage out of the code space. Uh, in the care cat uh, situation, well, you need uh, to rely on the single photon dissipation rate of your uh, uh, of your mode to 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 do that basically. And somehow we know that well, increasing the single photon dissipation rate, of course, comes at the expense of increasing the phase flip rate, which might not be very much desired. So. Um, there is the interest, uh, the, the big interest of using cat, cat, uh, care cats uh, is that uh, you can do, get, basically it's easier to get a large care than uh, getting a large two photon dissipation. Uh, which means that basically in the operations, in the gates that we're going to want to perform, that I'm going to talk about later, uh, you might be able to perform faster gates uh, with the care, care cats. So maybe uh, actually the, uh, the a good, uh, a good um, uh, solution would be to join the two of them together, basically have both solutions at the same time. Of course, it asks more uh, experimental work, but uh, to basically rely on the care uh, effect to remove the Hamiltonian perturbations, uh, spurious Hamiltonian perturbations, uh, and rely on the two photon dissipation to remove the basically the, the 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 perturbations which are at high frequency which are due to Limblad type terms basically. So that's I would say uh, maybe uh, I don't know whether it answers the question of your. Uh, 
Yeah, and uh, folks, feel free to follow up on that in the chat uh, if, yep. if you want to get deeper. But maybe for now, we'll press forward. Thank okay, you. so uh, just uh, uh, know how to go from, a, uh, let's say, half protected qubit, because it uh, doesn't have basically, or we can remove the face flips, uh, bit flips quite uh, efficiently, how to go to a full, fully protected. Well, there are many uh, approaches. There is, of course, these approaches, the uh, recent ones for the, where we basically tailor a surface code to take into the account the bias of the noise. Uh, and so usually in these papers, uh, we rely on uh, biases which are not too large. In the re most recent uh, Amazon paper, Amazon group paper, they uh, propose that we'll, even though, even if we have a, a, a bias noise, which is, uh, Quite large for the case of the cats. Uh, well, we can still imagine to have a first order error correction. So basically, a surface which is very thin on one direction and much wider on the other direction to correct for uh, bit flip errors. Um, so, in our group, basically, we think we might act at least to, uh, to get to the level of errors of 10 minus 10, we might be able to just rely on a repetition code. Uh, to correct for against uh, against these face flips, so I'm gonna try to, uh, uh, and of course, then if you go want to go even higher in uh, I mean in the error rate, uh, uh, then might, you might need to concatenate this repetition code with something else, or you need to, you might need to use a surface code, a thin surface code, as proposed by uh, the Amazon group. So, what is the idea? Somehow, the idea is quite similar to the Bacon Shore code. Right. I mean, the, in the case of the bacon show code, we know that the bacon show code is a re, is a concatenation of two repetition codes. So I was mentioning that each repetition code uh, can be replaced under the, the x uh, direction can be replaced by a cat. And so basically, or repetition cat qubit is somehow a bacon show code of cats. In that sense. And uh, so what we know with the, for the bacon show code is that there is no absolute pressure threshold per se. Because you know that well, it, when you want to decrease, for example, uh, the uh, error rate at the uh, of the uh, the bit flip error rate, well, you increase the the uh, the uh, dimension in this direction, so the, this uh, the x. Uh, but this comes at the le at the expense of increasing the probability of having the z uh, effective z error for this whole qubit, which is getting larger linearly, and so at some point you might. Basically, this uh, effective PZ dot uh, PZ prime can become larger than the threshold of a repetition code, so that you cannot uh, basically hope that this concatenation with the for the Z error correction would correct things, uh, would correct the face flips. But even though it's true that there is no uh, absolute threshold, there is uh, uh, some nice results for example this paper which show that even with reasonable error probabilities you can still even though there is no threshold you can still get to very low error, error probabilities that for me, most practical reasons might be enough and so that's basically the same situation for these repetition cat kids and uh, so okay now uh, let me just maybe uh, switch gears here so we have qubits which are which has a, which have a biased noise but so far we are just using them as a memory now we want to perform some operations on them. But of course, we should be careful with these operations because these per, per operations should not basically break down uh, the, the, uh, the uh, error suppression that we had uh, engineered so far through this uh, two-photon driven dam. Mm -hmm. uh, so basically, uh, we want to perform a bias-preserving uh, unitary operation uh, on our, on our uh, logical, on our basically cat cube. And this, you can, unfortunately, you cannot do anything you want. Basically, you know that, for example, if you perform a Hadamard gate, uh, this, of course, is, cannot be a bias-preserving operation because a Z operator through a Hadamard application of Hadamard becomes an X operator. So a Z error becomes actually an X error after the application of Hadamard. So, for example, Hadamard is forbidden. Uh, it's not a gate which can be in any ways implemented in a bias-preserving manner. So, the case that we can hope to be able uh, to perform in a bias preserving manner are x, y, or any uh, x or y logical operators or any rotation around, around the z axis. For, these are for single qubit gates. Uh, but even for these x and y gates, there is some subtlety. Uh, indeed, if you assume that you have a two level system 
and you want to basically make a rotation around the uh, x axis uh, from this x uh, uh, this x operator uh, x operation uh, through a continuous process and if you assume that through this continuous process at some point there is a jump there is a z jump happening there is a z error happening then uh, basically uh, you might end up uh, for example assume that let's assume that in the middle of the process there is a z jump happen happening and then uh, well you continue your rotation but then you're going to end up in the state zero instead of uh, or you said one instead of zero uh, where you want it to end up. so which is equivalent to an actual bit flip basically so you should be careful so basically uh, what we're, what we're saying is that there is uh, if you're only sticking with a two level system there is no way to perform actually even the x operation in a bias preserving manner even though uh, well, x z uh, basically uh, uh, article is basically is minus z x. So it seems like if we had uh, if this z operation had had happened only at the end of the operation, nothing would have bothered us. But if it happens through the process, then there is a problem. And then there is also some other issue is that the fact that uh, when you want to perform a pi rotation, but you perform a pi plus epsilon rotation, of course, you have also an issue because then this is equivalent to some type of X error as well. So systematic errors of your uh, of your K. And so this is also a problem. So uh, the good news is that, well, in the case of the cat qubits, we can do something. We can get around this problem and perform the X gate in a bias preserving manner. So, sorry, Mazi, a quick question. Yes. Uh, I you said that there is no way to make the you said the z operation in a bias preserving manner here no no x the x that, operation the x oh, okay right right because um, uh, yeah okay. you want to work in a two level system so, so what is the i'm confused by the text under this bias preserving continuous process in the sense that um, during the process you don't want to basically in the, uh, you don't want that an error during the process of rotation also uh, ends up as a bit flip at the end. So basically you have a phase flip occurring through the process of rotation, but at the end of the process, it look, it shows itself as an X error. And that's 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 a problem. I see, okay. I see. And I guess there was a question from the audience and I think you already said it, but there's no way to do the Hanamard bias preserved. Uh... Yes, that's true. So yeah, this, the set of bias preserving gates cannot be universal. That's for sure. I see. Hanamard is not. And for the Z gates, uh, we can say that those can be ideal yeah. in a sense because they're virtual gates, potentially. Oh, the Z, uh, you mean X, uh, well, X, X, Y, and Z gate, they are, yeah, you can also perform them in a virtual manner, but I'm here I'm assuming that they, I'm trying to perform them physically. But the Z of theta is a rotate, so you can perform any rotation around the Z axis, and then the pi rotation, uh, around the x and y axis but uh, those are the operations that in principle should be uh, visible as i mentioned again x and y are not visible if you stick with a two level system mm -hmm. you're going to use the fact that a cat state is defined actually in an infinite dimensional Hilbert space to perform these operations in a vice president manner. Mm -hmm. okay. Mm -hmm. interesting okay yes thank you okay. so here is the overall scheme Protocol. So basically, there we have on the left you see some operations that we can perform in a bias preserving manner, and on the right you see the gates that we can build from these gates at the level of the repetition code and which are fully protected. So, on the left, what are the operations? So, we have this z of theta and cz of theta, control z of theta. So, these, uh, these operations, uh, well, we are not surprised to see that we can perform them in a bias preserving manner. As I mentioned, X operation is more complicated and actually control not and totally we can show this that these two as well are not feasible if you stick with two two level systems. You really use the uh, the structure of the cat qubits to perform these operations in a uh, in a in a bias preserving manner. Okay. And then you have this preparation of plus and minus states and the measurement of the X operator, which are somehow vice preserving by nature. Basically, they're uh, the eigenstates of the X operator. So somehow the X errors are, do not affect them. 
And then on the on the right, what do you have as operations? So you have some operations like control not, which can perform true control uh, in a in a uh, in a transversal manner, in a repetition code. Basically, you, you see the circuit here. I'm gonna come back to this later. Uh, but some operations which are not trivial, we can perform also a Toffoli gate, which is fully protected here. And basically, what we can show is that tr these gates are universal together. So basically, with these in, in gates here, we can construct a Hadamard, and we know that a Hadamard and Toffoli is a universal set of gates. So, mm -hmm. attention here, Hadamard, we don't have Hadamard at this level. We never try to make a Hadamard at the level of the uh, cat qubits. We make them at the level of repetition cat qubits, where we can protect against, against phase flips as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so, and so, the, so, what does the blue dotted uh, square mean? Oh, it just means that these two are enough to have a universal set. Oh, I see. <laughs> and, uh, and then the little parallel signs, the transversal? Uh... It means that all these operations that are with parallel signs can be done in a, in a transversal manner, in the sense that uh, you just, in order to perform, for example, a C0 gate between two, Q, two repetition codes, you just perform the, a C0 gate in a parallel manner between the first and uh, first qubit of each of the two blocks, the second of the two blocks, and, and the same thing for the X gate, and the same thing for the measurement and preparation. Mm -hmm. But TOEFL mm -hmm. is not transversal. It's the other, the only operation which is not transversal, and uh, mm -hmm. then you will have to construct it in a different manner, as we can imagine. Mm -hmm. TOEFL is a non clifford gate, so that's the hard part basically that we have to make. Gotcha. Uh -huh. This okay. Approach. And and okay. when you say hard. Uh, Sort of how does it scale or how, how hard is it to implement? So I, I, I'm, I'm going to get back to that at the end. So I, I'm okay. seeing that I'm going very slow. I, I don't know whether how much time I, I can, how, how much um, can I go over, over go the, my time actually? We can, uh, we can, yeah, we can, we can go, let's, let's, let's say 10 minutes. 10 minutes more. Okay. So we we'll have to go fairly fast, but not too fast. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So there are two types of ideas from these gates. So maybe I'm not going to focus that much on this uh, green idea, basically the Zeno effect. So these are what we call the Zeno gates. And these uh, orange ones are what we call hood deformation gates. So I'm not going to spend too much time on the Zeno gates. The idea is that just that uh, if you, on top of your uh, driven dissipative mechanism, which we had, which we modeled through this to photon exchange uh, dissipation, A squared minus alpha squared. If on top of that, you add some perturbation of the form, a epsilon A plus A dagger, which is basically a, a, a just a resonant drive uh, on, the, on, your, uh, on your cat mode, basically. Then what happens is just that uh, you effectively are performing a Z operation, Z rotation. Basically what you see is that through this uh, operation, you might want, you're pushing your, um, cat state in the P direction, in the ortho and the uh, vertical direction. And through the two photon process, the two blocks of the cat, the alpha and minus alpha state are maintained at the same level. So only the fringes get to revolve. And so basically this is uh, going from red to blue. You know that it's going from plus to minus state, so which, is, which means that rotation around the Z axis of your system. So this is basically the way you would like to perform Z operations. Yes. Yeah. Quick question. I mean, in in um, let's say more standard single qubit implementation of the Z gates, you know, oftentimes uh, the Z gates can be done virtually by phase shifting the references. Uh, here I'm talking about Z Z of theta, so it means any angle of the, around Z. It's not only a Z logical operation. It's that's right. Yeah. yeah. Pi over two rotation. Pi over two rotation. That's right. R Z of theta. But I guess here here you can't really uh, do the do that virtual gate, so to speak, right? Uh, if you want to, uh, you know, the question of virtual gates is more at a higher level. It asks, I mean, we can ask it at a higher level. It's and says, uh, in some sense, these virtual gates you can perform them uh, virtually as far as you're not uh, hitting any non Clifford operation, right? I mean, if you're in your, in your logical circuit, you don't have any Clifford, non Clifford circuit, you can perform any X, Y, Z uh, logical operator. I'm not talking about Z of theta, I'm talking about Z. Of which is, uh, which is basically Z of pi, if you want. That operator, you can indeed do it uh, in software. There is no problem. Uh, I'm just uh, here and uh, mentioning how we can perform it in physically, but mm -hmm. uh, if we wanted to perform it indeed Z of P pi, uh, we, we are indeed, uh, we, we can still stick with uh, 
people filming it in South South. That's, that's not for mm -hmm. me. Mm -hmm. It's just you know, any other people. Okay, yeah. thank you. Okay, so this is uh, this, this story is the same also for other uh, rotation like ZZ of theta, so for between two two modes, which is an entangling gate between the two qubits. I'm not gonna, it's a CZ gate. It's, you can engineer CZ gates in the same manner, but I'm not gonna explain that. Uh, you can basically look at uh, this neutron physics paper, for example, uh, to see that. Uh, just mention that this experiment of this gate, this Zeno gate, was performed uh, in 2018 uh, by Michel Debray's group, by Stephen Tuza. Uh, so basically, he was able to see it in deep, this dynamics, this Rabi oscillation, basically, of a, of a cat qubit. And up to now, it's the only gate that we have implemented uh, on the dissipated cat qubits. Okay, so all the rest is new, uh, basically new, new proposals. So what is the idea for this X gate? I mentioned to you, I told you that if you stick with a block sphere of a two-level system, you are not able to do this X gate in a bias-preserving manner. The idea is that you go outside your block sphere somehow. So somehow you use the infinite dimensional Hilbert space of your harmonic oscillator to perform this operation. And the way you can understand it in this uh, dissipative mechanism is that you take your alpha coherent state and you make it rotate uh, perhaps slowly. So this uh, the, uh, slowly means that this time t needs to be long enough. So long enough with respect to two photon dissipation rate, basically. And then basically you make somehow uh, change uh, continuously your pointer states, alpha minus alpha in the phase space somehow and go from alpha to minus alpha. And so uh, this basically performs uh, effectively an X gate. You know that uh, you see that the, at the end, the alpha has ended up in minus alpha and vice versa. And somehow if you had a superposition, for example, the Yorkie Stoller superposition, zero plus I1, you end up with zero minus I1, which is basically showing that you have performed this X gate. Uh, it, mm -hmm. and, and, um, mm -hmm. and how, how uh, and now, Maybe you want, uh, I don't know whether this is what you wanted to ask. How would you do that? Uh, this, uh, oh, yes, <laughs> <laughs> it's, yeah, and, it's just. Yeah, and I guess my other thing was, you know, you're sort of, well, I guess, you, you know, you're you're not exactly leaving the logical space, you're redefining it also maybe. And that's yeah, it's the, that's why we call it code deformation. Basically, you're deforming your code. Somehow your new code at each, your code at each time is defined now with, not with the state alpha and minus alpha, but it's defined with the state alpha exponential i theta and minus alpha exponential i theta. So yeah, I see. Very cool. Mm. Okay, so uh, how would you do that in practice? It's actually quite easy. As I well, I might need to go a little bit back. Uh, so I told you here that this value of alpha is given by this ratio between epsilon two and kappa two. So basically, uh, it's only enough to change the phase of this uh, epsilon two drive, which is itself uh, can be done by changing the phase of this epsilon d drive here, and then uh, so it's just basically continuously changing the phase of your drive uh, epsilon d uh, to perform this operation. It's it's actually pretty easy in practice. Um, Okay, so well, this is but this is a trivial operation, of course. Oops, I have to wait now. <laughs> uh, this is somehow a trivial operation, as you mentioned, Zlatko. We can also do it in software. We don't need to do it in practice. No, something more interesting. Uh, oh, okay. So I see that I had it here. I didn't need to go. Back. I'm sorry. So basically, that I was mentioning, we just need to go to change the space of this uh, this drive uh, in practice to get that modulation of uh, phase of alpha. And, yeah. uh, and maybe you'll tell us, and I'm anticipating your next slides, but uh, this has been sort of performed, tested? No, not yet. Uh, not, not yet. Good. Not yet. OK, got it. Great. OK, so uh, how can we do something maybe more interesting, which is slightly more interesting, which is the CNAP gate, for example? Well, slightly much more interesting, which is the CNAP gate. Uh, so what is a CNOT gate? So this is this operation basically in our CAT basic uh, basis. It's very well approximated, exponentially well approximated with this operation. When we are in the state alpha, we want to do identity. 
and variable in the state minus alpha, we want to switch minus alpha to alpha and vice versa on the target cat. So, okay, so the idea that I'm going to present here was initially presented in this paper for the care cat case uh, uh, by Shruti Puri and Kovokas. So we basically adapted this idea to the case of the cepative cat. I'm going to present it here. So we have on one side on the control cat, uh, control cat, uh, cat cubit, you have uh, basically you still you stick with your two foot under the dissipative mechanism to the same thing that we have here and on the target one though we engineer a new kind of dissipation where you have at the same time a and alpha so basically it's a two uh, so the, in this dissipative mechanism uh, you have uh, you're mixing somehow the b mode the target mode and the a mode the control mode so let's before explaining how one can do such a thing in practice let me explain how it works so if no assume that the qubit one the qubit a is in the state alpha what happens is that uh, basically a the a takes the value alpha so the, basically this orange part disappears and you see only the blue part so basically a you can replace it with alpha so you get e squared minus alpha squared so basically you see this regular two foot dissipation that we had always so basically, it's like identity. When we are on alpha, uh, we, uh, the, when the cat state uh, A uh, is in alpha, the, the cat mode B basically sees identity. Uh, basically, it sees the same dissipation mechanism as if we hadn't done anything. Whereas if now A takes the value minus alpha, no, this is the orange part that remains. And then uh, what happens is just that you see now the operation, the, uh, the limbat operator associated to the X gate that we had mentioned in the previous slide. So the one which changes during the time. And so basically uh, your target cat qubit now gets rotated. Now, how one can engineer this? Basically you need to have these two modes coupled uh, through the same, uh, yeah, perhaps ATS or any other mixing device to your uh, buffer mode. And then uh, what you want to engineer is these three types of interaction. So this one is the one we had already engineered, so this two photon exchange Hamiltonian. This one is the regular resonant drive at the buffer mode that we had as well. And we have this new Hamiltonian that we need to engineer, which is an exchange Hamiltonian between the buffer mode and the A mode. So this also can be done in principle with three phase mixing, with a three phase mixing process and U pump and some phase and amplitude modulation. We can perform this time variation of epsilon d and g1 that is required for this time variation here. So we need to have all of them together. So we, it's adding new pumps, basically. We have three pumps here. OK, so well, I'm going to skip this. Totally gate can be realized in a basically a similar manner. And it's still realizable in, in principle with three wave mixing processes. Okay. So I'm not going to go with that because it's a of time. And maybe just mention that we can perform uh, quite involved, uh, we can perform a uh, uh, complete simulations of this process, for example, a C naught gate uh, in presence of single photon decay rates and stuff. And, uh, and we can basically understand very well, quite well, the phase flip rate and B flip rate of these systems. So, we, what you see on one side is that B flip error rate is exponentially suppressed. So, we see what we see here is that uh, the black curves represent the uh, the, the bit flip error rate uh, of your C naught gate when you change, you vary the duration of your gate. And uh, what you see is that the, the overall level of this error goes from 10 minus 4 to something like about around 10 minus 7 and then to 10 minus 9. So this is the exponential suppression that I was mentioning in the bit flip rate. And the phase flip error rates, well, the phase flip error rates, there is going to be two kind of contributions. On the control qubit, you're going to have uh, one part of contribution on the phase flip error rate which comes because of the single photon loss, the intrinsic loss of the cavity, and some part which comes from the adiabatic, non-adiabatic uh, effects. So the fact that your gate is, you're not doing it in infinite time. Uh, you're doing it in some finite time and this finite time basically induces some errors, uh, some phase flip type errors uh, on the control qubit that we cannot really understand quite well. Uh, and uh, so which incre which incre which decreases so basically you have two types of errors so one error which increases of course with the type uh, with the time when of course the kappa one type error and the non adiabatic uh, error which decrease with time 
So basically, you see that there is a, and then you have the target errors, uh, face flip errors, which is only given by this single photon. And so, of course, if you want to, for example, optimize the fidelity, you can choose an optimal time uh, of gate, uh, which does that for you. Okay, so let me now go, no, let's finish. So, okay, so we can perform now this uh, using these CNOT errors that are uh, uh, used that I mentioned here. We can now perform an error correction on a phase, uh, on a, on a uh, repetition code based uh, on these cat qubits. Uh, so this is basically the natural, uh, the simple way to perform, you basically perform parity operators, parity measurements between these data cats and these ancillary cats. And then you perform the X operator, which is the parity of the cat somehow, uh, on the ancillary cats in a destructive manner. And then redo the same thing again. And based on these measurement results, you perform some syndrome extraction and some decoding, and you correct at the end uh, this uh, the state of your repetition cat cube. So let's say that we have performed some simulations where we have considered some what we call circuit-based error model, where basically everything is uh, has an error, whether it's in preparation of ancilla in the CNAT gate measurements, everything, every step of this operation, we have assumed some. Uh, physically reasonable error rate for all of these uh, error for all of these operations. Yes, let go. You wanted to say something. I, I was just going to say that that's a lot of uh, a lot of red stars, <laughs> a lot yeah. of errors. So <laughs> yeah. So basically, considering what is the closest to the real experiments, so basically. And and these level. are are these errors at the level of, of you know like uh, during the dynamics or at the level of uh, gates you insert. So, after. Basically, we have done simula similar simulations to the to the one I showed you for the CNAT for all other operations, and we know basically somehow we can understand quite well what are the level of errors for any operation here, uh, because which is which can be due to single photon loss or non uh, during the operation or a non hepatic effect or anything else, and then we take them into account in this error model. That's, that's, that's oh, okay. You you model them yes, as an effective yeah, yeah. channel. Yeah. So basically, yep. there are two levels of simulation: simulations of physical operations, and then simulate the total simulation of the of the logical circuit. Mm -hmm. Got it. Okay. Awesome. Thanks. Okay. So and, and gonna... uh, maybe a technical question for the size of the simulation here: Did you were you just able to do this with uh, all the modes, or do you have to use like matrix product states or something a little more fancy? No, no. You can. Uh, no, no. Basically, okay. So maybe uh, this you can perform these simulations quite efficiently. Actually, this simulation is really, really much easier than. But we have more complicated simulations of totally circuits, which require some uh, use, using the CHP algorithm of uh, Scott Aronson and Daniel Gutesman to perform uh, somehow uh, because basically we simulate the errors of our, our, our circuit, which are only Clifford errors. And then uh, these Clifford errors can be efficiently simulated through some, uh, uh, through this uh, algorithm. Basically, we, what we simulate is the stabilizers of the system uh, rather than, than the full state of the system. And do you have to worry about um, sort of leakage out of out of the logical space here? Um, okay, so that's a very good question. So in principle, in principle, in the case of the cats, uh, dissipated cats, that's not a big issue because basically what you can imagine is that uh, at the end of each gate, you might have some uh, basically some small uh, waiting time, somehow, uh, which basically uh, where it refocuses all, all the every state refocuses back in your logical space, uh, which is the cat sticks. So is that, uh, I don't know whether does answer. Basically, because of this two foot on dissipative mechanism, uh, we go back very well and exponentially uh, mm -hmm. uh, precisely to the, cat, to the cat code space. So. OK, yeah, so, so that never accumulates to over. That never that accumulates to uh, something sizable. Yes. Interesting, great. Thank you. Uh, so, okay, maybe I'm going to skip this slide. So this is the main, main result that we can look at. So uh, what you see here is uh, the result of these simulations for the memory. So for the memory, on the memory side, uh, what we can say is that, uh, well, it, what happens here is it's a similar figure than to the one I, w I showed at the very beginning for the surface code, basically. What, are, what do we have on the x-axis is the physical error probability, which is somehow given by this uh, house, how big 
your cat is times kappa one times the time of the gate. Somehow this is the, the good figure of merit to compare to, uh, which itself can be uh, related to the ratio between kappa one and kappa two photon. So kappa two is what we engineer. We want to make it large and kappa one what is, is what is undesired, the single photon dissipation rate of your cavity, which, which is as small as possible. So basically this is how Going to the left on this axis, of course, gets is getting harder and harder. Uh, experiments uh, maybe need to more do more experimental work. Uh, let's say that the current state of art experiment is the one by Stephen Tuza, where he had a ratio kappa one over kappa two of about ten minus two. Okay, so here I'm showing things which are much small, much smaller. And then what you see here is that uh, at if you are at the level of uh, physical error probability of let's say ten minus two, which corresponds to something about uh, 10 minus 3 for kappa 1 over kappa 2, then you would need something about, uh, in order to get to a level of error of 10 minus 5, you need something about 40, uh, 40 cat qubits with size 9. Or if you want to get to the level of 10 minus 10, you need something about 80 cat qubits with about 15, uh, with a size of uh, about uh, 15 photons. 15 uh, and sorry, the size here, this is the uh, n-bar squared? N -bar. Yes, n-bar uh, 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 squared. And so if you go, of course, if you get can get to better, uh, um, better cavities, so I know that, uh, for example, Amazon people are heading for something about 10 minus 5, then you can reduce drastically these numbers. Of course, you see that. For example, if you have 10 minus 4 level, you only need about 10, level, 10 uh, cat qubits and a cat of size 7 to get to 10 minus 5 or 13 uh, photons and 20 modes to get to, 10, uh, to minus 10. Okay. Awesome. Maybe one quick question. Um, the photon numbers here all seem a bit larger than I think most of the experiments I recall in the past. Is, is there sort of yes. a... So that's yeah. that's basically going to be what... Uh, so I think it's going to be the bottleneck. We lead, so we hope that... I, I showed you the experiment by Zeki and Raphael and uh, others that uh, they where they showed that, well, they can get uh, to four, five, uh, six photons. Uh, and, well, it got saturated because of this problem that I was mentioning. We hope that we can get to higher values. So, of course, we don't know whether... Uh, how how I mean basically how far can we go in this uh, suppression of local errors and how far should we go till we reach some big obstacle on the uh, which is somehow harder to get rid of on this uh, kind of no local uh, operate uh, no local processes in the phase space of your harmonic oscillator. But I guess that's only time. I mean we will need to do these experiments and go uh, go and uh, go higher in these values and see. Where this happens but just increasing this n bar in practice in the experiment is not a hard thing you know it's just increasing this drive, drive strength but the question is that uh, and and looking at the big flips is not hard either the face flip of course gets smaller uh, the face flip time gets of course very short that's why i need i'm saying this ratio between kappa one and kappa two is telling you how uh, basically how if you can make this kappa one very small then you can still, de uh, with 15 photons, you can still have a face flip error probability, which is smaller than the face flip error threshold of a repetition code, basically. That's the hope. Is it clear? Awesome. Yeah, yeah thanks. OK. And so uh, let me just mention that in this curve, I've, I've included both logical face flip and bit flip errors. So as I was mentioning, a single bit flip of any cat qubit can lead to a logical bit flip. So that's in taken, into, taken into account here. And then also the logical phase flip, which is given by the repetition code, is taken into account. Okay, so maybe just let me mention also that any transversal operation that I was mentioning here, so this was the performance of a memory, of a quantum memory. But any transversal operation here, for example, the CNOT operation, has a similar performance. Basically, you can perform it with a similar uh, error probability uh, using as it's transversal, you can uh, use it uh, basically perform it in a similar with the same error probability uh, 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 and with the same overhead. The only thing which is complicated is the Toffoli. So, and the Toffoli, the problem with the Toffoli is that it's not transversal. There is question mark, but it's unfortunately the, the answer is that no. The uh, logical Toffoli is not equivalent to a, a transversal parallel physical Toffoli between these three points. And uh, well, let me just maybe mention that uh, 
how can we want to do uh, physical Toffoli? For, for example, one way to do that is uh, is that by noticing that actually a Toffoli is what? It's a control C0, right? It's, uh, we want to control with the first logical qubit this a C0 operation between the two second, uh, between the two other logical blocks. And we know that the C0 itself is transverse. So somehow we want to perform uh, the control operation uh, here. Uh, so we basically we want to perform to control these uh, control not operations with as with the state of this first cat state, uh, this uh, basically repetition cat state. So what is the zero logical and the one logical? If you write it as in a, as a superpositions of zeros and ones, which are alphas and minus alphas, basically what represents zero is uh, the state with an even number of uh, ones. And what uh, re represents the state of one is, uh, or uh, an even number of minus alphas, if you want. Uh, and uh, one is an odd number of minus alphas. So basically, what what are we going to do? We're going to perform this operation in this manner. So you see what's going on here. So basically, I'm saying that I'm performing a C-naught operation on this logical block, controlled by the state of the first physical cubic here. And then by the second physical qubit here and the third physical qubit here. If an even number of them is uh, one, then I'm applying an even number of C nuts here. And if an odd number of them is uh, are given by ones, we, I'm applying an odd number of C nuts. And I know that C nut to the power two is identity. So basically, if I've applied an even number of uh, C nuts, I've applied identity. If I've applied an odd number of C nuts, I've applied a C nut. So basically, this total circuit uh, is no equivalent to a logical TOEFL. Unfortunately, though, it's not transversal. You see that uh, these, this qubit here needs to talk to all qubits uh, on the second and third blocks. And this is a source of problem. In particular, this circuit by itself is not fault tolerant because, for example, an, a Z error that uh, occurs on this uh, target block here can propagate uh, on all the qubits of the first block, for example, and create actually a logical Z error uh, at the level of the first block, typically. Then you have also another type of error problem for the fault tolerance is that you have an accumulation of non-propagating errors. This, this Basically, when you increase the size of this uh, cat code, uh, this uh, repetition code, you're going to have this qubit is going to be seen D times uh, by, uh, by these gates. Uh, and so this D increases, of course. And then, uh, which means that the depth of your circuit increases with uh, with the with the uh, with the length of your repetition code, and that's usually not a uh, fault tolerant uh, circuit. This is, however, a smaller problem than the first one. Uh, so let me just mention that the first one can be get uh, fixed through something which is called the peaceable fault tolerance. So the idea was introduced in this paper by Isaac Trunk groups. Uh, so basically, the idea is that you can add, you can rearrange this uh, physical topolis that I was mentioning, and perform some error correction on the target uh, block uh, at major intermediary states, which avoids the propagation of errors to the control uh, qubits. So somehow, in this way, we get rid of the first problem, the red problem that I was showing show you in the previous slide, and this gives you something which is already quite quite good. Uh, so if you look at now perform simulations similar to ones I was mentioning before, uh, and you get, uh, if you look at the physical error probability of a totally gate, and at this level, logical error, uh, error, error level, then you can see that you can get to, for example, you can get to the level of uh, uh, 10 minus 6 uh, by using something which is at the level of 10 minus 2, or half a percent error probability. For totally, you can get to 10 minus 6 by some distance, which is given by 15. So basically 15 position, 15 cats per, per logical cube. Uh, of course, uh, I want to mention that this, uh, uh, so that what, and one way to make it fully fault tolerant is by concatenation. It's just that uh, basically, as soon as you are below this line, you can basically concatenate one of these repetition code with another repetition code and get a better, even better fidelity uh, totally gates. For example, you can get a error, error rate of 10 minus 10 for this totally uh, by using a concatenation of a seven qubit repetition code with an 11 qubit repetition code 
where each SOFOE is performed at a level of a half a percent error probability, as I was mentioned. Okay, so it's not that bad. It's okay. Well, there are. In order to fix this second, the the big problem I would say with this scheme is that it's it's maybe not uh, very suitable to a two D architecture, because as you see, this qubit is now seeing all the qubits of the second block. So basically, you cannot find a two D architecture with I mean at least without using many swap gates or such kind of thing. Uh, you cannot uh, make it two D. Well, you can use swap case, of course, to make it to, uh, compatible to a 2D structure, but that adds some new complexities. And so I would say I would jump directly to this third method, which gets fixed that, uh, fixed that, fixes that. So this is using the magic state uh, injection. So the magic state uh, injection, well, you might know that. So you know that instead of, uh, that's what people want to use also for the surface code. But here there is some simplification of this magic state uh, preparation, basically, mechanism because of the bias, biased uh, problem. Bias noise that we have. I'm sorry, uh, Zlatko, I'm going way over time. So I might just uh, quickly uh, say that uh, the idea is that you can prepare this uh, um, uh, magic state of a, f uh, of a, of a totally uh, gate uh, in a fault tolerant manner using the bias, uh, bias noise property of the, uh, of the, of the qubits. You and keeping with a 2D architecture, basically using only transversal gates, as is shown in this picture. And uh, the nice property is that basically you you can remove a lot of complexities re re related to the distillation of these magic states, uh, and that's somehow discussed in this paper by uh, Amazon Group. Uh, but I want to just mention that if you stick with the, at the level of the repetition code, this is fairly easy. Actually, what we can show is that, for example, with the error probability of a perturbable gate of about a percent, you only need something about 20 modes per repetition code and 60 measurement repetitions of this measurement to perform, to prepare a uh, magic state with, at, the le at the error probability level of 10 minus 10, which is quite remarkable. I think. Uh, and then you need to inject it, but the injection of this uh, magic state is done through CNAT gates that we know how to perform. Uh, well, through gates that we know how to perform uh, uh, in a simpler manner. Uh, okay, so I want just to wrap up here. So I would say that uh, the two experimental challenges to overcome, I would say, to for this roadmap, I say, is uh, the one that I you were mentioning, Zlatko. And so basically, we have to maybe go to newer and newer generations of this experiment by Raphael and Zeki and see how far can we push this end bar and see this exponential suppression. Basically, how how what are the kind of no local uh, errors that could occur and which could limit us, and how to how to remove them. We know that these kind of no local errors can also occur in the surface code. For example, this uh, cosmic rays uh, experiment recently showed that actually. And then there is, of course, this uh, ratio between kappa one and kappa two. How large can we make it? Or basically, how small can we make it? Sorry, kappa one uh, with respect to kappa two, so that we can have an efficient suppression of phase waves with a few modes, cat modes. That's the second, basically, uh, experimental challenge to overcome. I would say in the comes in the years to come. And with that, I would like to thank uh, my co-workers. So Jeremy is here, so he's now at Alice and Bob Group. So I want also to. Uh, so this is the Quantic team in Paris. Uh, and then uh, I want also to thank my colleagues at Yale with whom I've worked through the past uh, 10 years, I would say, and to develop all these ideas. Uh, so, yeah, I think I'm going to stop here. So I feel happy to Wonderful. answer questions. Yeah, thank you, Maziar. Um, I, I do have a few more questions, um, but maybe in the interest of time, we'll keep it very short. Um, because we have many questions during the talk, so thank you for this wonderful talk. By the way, if you wanted to say any sort of final words or, or notes or thoughts before we uh, sort of wrap up, you know, this, this is a good time. Sure. Uh, so in, I would like to say that, well, we are uh, always looking for uh, motivated uh, postdocs and PhD students, especially on the theory side now, for the experiment, on the experimental side, I think we are somehow booked for now, but uh, I, if I'm understand me correctly. I think Zaki knows better than that. If you want to contact Zaki on the experimental side, you can do that. But on the theory side, we are always looking for postdocs and PhD students. So don't feel free to contact contact me if you're interested in such topics. 
Wonderful. Yeah. And um, we'll try to get the rest of the questions to you afterwards. I think people are thanking you for the awesome talk, Maziar. So I think with that, thank you folks for tuning in. Thank you, Maziar, for a great talk. And this video will stay live on YouTube so you can go back and rewatch it. And otherwise, folks, we'll see you next Friday at noon Eastern time. Thank you.